Hey everyone, today we're talking about JavaScript's array.reduce method, which is definitely the hardest of the array methods, but of course it's also a must-know. Hate it when that happens. Alright, here we go. So reduce is in the same family of array methods uh, as for each and map and filter, each of which are going to accept a callback and then call that callback with every single element from the array one at a time. Of course, they differ in what they actually do after that point, but they all follow that same pattern. You pass through a callback and it's executed once for every element in the array. Reduce is similar in that we do provide a callback, and that callback will be executed for 5, and then for 3, and then 9, and then 8, if this is the array we're using. But there's also a second parameter in here, and there's a second argument, and there's some funky stuff going on that makes Reduce a lot trickier to pick up when you're starting out. So, first of all, if you don't know for each map and filter, I would start there and then come back, because Reduce is a little confusing, but it's also very flexible and powerful. The first thing to know is that reduce expects a callback function, and at the end of the day, it's going to return to us a single value. Now that value might be a primitive, like a single number. We can take an array of numbers and reduce it down to a sum. 28 is the sum of all these numbers. Or it could be the maximum number, in this case is 9. So that's a value we could find using reduce, or the minimum. But we're not limited to actual numbers, we could work with an object as the return value of reduce. This is a frequency map telling me A occurs twice in this array, B occurs three times, F once. So it's an array of values that are reduced down to a single thing, whatever that thing is. Here's one more example, an array of arrays, two-dimensional, we could use reduce to flatten uh, into a single one-dimensional array. And what makes it all possible is the mechanic underlying reduce. So our callback function is not only going to be passed each element one at a time from the array, but it's also passed through whatever value was returned from the previous execution of the callback. So there's this thread tying together each iteration. We can pass a value through, we can preserve a value, preserve the sum and keep adding on to it, or the maximum and keep updating what the maximum is, or uh, this object with frequencies, we keep updating that every time the callback is executed. So one more time, I'm gonna show this to you in code. It will make a lot more sense if you're confused, but whatever callback we write and pass to reduce, it will be provided the value returned from the previous execution of the callback. So reduce expects a callback that has two parameters. And that first parameter, call it whatever you want, that is what will be passed the previous return value. So whatever we returned last time from this callback will be stored under previous val. And then current val, the second parameter, call it whatever you want, uh, is just going to refer to one element from the array, one at a time, in order. So, you know, it will start as 5, and then 3, and then 9, just like for each map filter, all of them. And then there's an optional second argument, which is after the callback, this second argument will be used to set the initial value for that first parameter. It's all very confusing, but remember, if this is supposed to refer to whatever we returned last time the callback ran, that's great, but the very first time, there was no last time. So what does it refer to? That's what that second argument is for. So in this case, previous would start as an empty object. In this case, total starts at zero. So let's look at an example. This is a simple example, very classic reduce 101 example of summing the numbers in an array. And this diagram kind of shows the flow of information from one callback to the next. So, uh, or one callback execution to the next. We have our numbers, five, three, and nine. We have two parameters in our callback, sum, that will refer to whatever is returned from the callback, but it starts at zero. And then current val will hold one of these numbers in the array in order, one at a time. So the first time the callback is executed, sum is zero. Current val is five, because it starts at the beginning. So that means we return zero plus five, which is five. And then this is the, the magic, the really important part of reduce, that five doesn't just disappear, it's stored and passed through as the new value for sum on the second execution. So now sum is five, current value is three. We return five plus three, which is eight. And that value is returned and once again, plugged back in as the next value for sum on the final iteration. Eight plus nine, return that. Now we've hit the end of the array. The callback is no longer executed anymore. And whatever that final return value is, is the total return value or the overall return value of reduce, in this case, 17. 
So what powers this whole thing is being able to take whatever we returned last time and have access to it next time, or the current time, if you will. And we can build up the sum one iteration at a time. And let me just prove that it works. We have our five, three, and nine array. Here's the same exact reduce. We get 17. Now, this second argument after the whole callback, right? That's the first argument right there. After that, whatever this is, is the initial value for our first parameter in that callback. So if I start it at 1000, we get 1017. Probably don't want to start it at 1000, but I can. Now, we don't always need to have a value there. And that's what the second example is going to show. So this is using reduce to find the maximum element in an array, which by the way, there is a math.max method, probably better to use that. But this is another simple example of using reduce. So if you think about how you would find the max using reduce, where we can preserve one value each iteration, we basically keep track of whatever the maximum is as we move around the array from left to right. So 45 starts as the max, is 23 bigger? No. So that means 45 is gonna be passed through. Is 98 bigger? Yes. And then we keep track of 98 and we keep comparing and then eventually we figure out 103 is the largest. So if we don't provide an initial starting value as a second argument, reduce will actually have the first parameter start as the first element in the array. And then the current value will skip and start as the second. So we basically begin with 45 and 23 which you don't always want, but in the case of something like finding the maximum, whoa, if we started with zero, like that could work, but what if our array was all negative? Zero is a really bad choice then because it's bigger than all of the array elements. So if you look at the logic here, it's very straightforward. It's actually more verbose than it needs to be, but it's easy to, to understand. Basically, if the current value is bigger than the maximum, return the current value. Otherwise, return the maximum. So we just return whichever one is larger. In the very first time, Max starts as 45, current value is 23. Which one is bigger? 45 is returned. And then that is remembered for the next time through. It's provided as the new value for max. Max is 45, current val is 98. We return 98 because that's bigger. Then that's remembered. I keep saying remembered, but it's nothing fancy. It's just passed through as the next value for max. Max is 98, compare that to 25, return 98. That's passed through one more time. Max is 98, current val is 103, compare those. 103 is bigger, that's the end. There's no more execution cycles. So that last return value of 103 is the overall return value for this reduced call. And that is indeed the maximum. So hopefully this example makes it clear uh, or clearer how this process works of having your return value being passed through over and over and over and how we can use that as a tool to preserve some important piece of information. In our case, the maximum as we progress or in the previous example, the running sum as we progress. But we're not limited to things with numbers and to you know arithmetic or comparisons like this. One of the more common uses of reduce is to calculate frequencies or to group data together based upon some existing array-based data structure. So here's this example with grades. I'm a teacher, I have a list of grades, A, B, F, B, C, C, A. And then down here, I'll zoom in a bit, uh, I've got a call to reduce, where what I'm going to do is build up a frequency object. I showed this on the slides, where it will show something like A is 3 and B is 5, keeping track of uh, how many times each value appears in the array. And the way that we do this is by starting out with an empty object, so not 0 or something, but an empty object. And then each time through, I'm going to look at each grade and check to see if that grade exists in this object. And the very first time, of course, it won't. Like A, the first time, it doesn't exist. So this is true. It's set to null, meaning we then add it into this dictionary object and set it to 1. So A, not that, <laughs> would be set to 1. And then we return this object now that has a little value and a little bit of information. And then the process repeats next up for B and then F, right? So those both get set in here. A is one, B will be set to one, F is one. And then on the fourth iteration, this is what it would look like as it is passed into grades freak frequency. But this time grade is B and B already is in there. So instead we increment it by one and it goes up to two. So this is another example, just a very different idea. Instead of summing things up, we're counting and we're building up uh, a larger data structure. Let me just run this and show you. It does work. 
A is 3, B is 5, C is 3. But the concept underpinning it is all about preserving one value between iterations of our callback, between each execution. But instead of preserving a single number, we're now preserving a dictionary or an object that is passed through and modified every time through that callback. So I know it can be overwhelming, it's confusing. Um, I don't expect this video to you know, teach you everything or anything necessarily, but I hope you got something out of it. Uh, take a look at the slides, walk through this, put console.logs and just practice with reduce and see if you can understand every step of the way how it works. And then eventually you'll start to kind of think in terms of reduce, which is the final step. And that's it. So thanks for watching, I hope you learned something. Uh, if you wanna check out any of my courses, there's a link here with all the, you know, coupons and stuff, lowest prices I can give you, blah, 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 subscribe, whatever. Um, and thanks for watching. I hope you have a great rest of your week and I hope you enjoy using Reduce.